So in this course so far, we've looked at the fundamental of carbonate deposition, and we've also looked in greater detail at the biological control and the sedimentation of carbonates as well as sequence stratigraphy. But the one thing we've not done is talk about what happens to carbonate post-deposition. So how, for instance, do you create those beautiful mineral into a fracture? And of course, I'm talking about diagenesis. And this is going to be the topic of the rest of the course. Well, in this class, we really didn't go that far. I'm, I'm not bringing you to the field today. I'm bringing you home, and home is where my lab is. So behind me, what you see is the clumped isotope lab at Imperial College. That's my baby, and it's a, an opportunity to discuss the different methods that we can use in diagenesis. Because before you can understand the process of diagenesis, you have to understand the tools that we use to determine diagenesis, notably the use of stable isotopes. So when we look at carbonate rocks and we try to understand diagenesis, the first step is always petrography. So we have a microscope lab. And in this microscope lab, we have two types of microscope. One is a petrographic microscope. So that's a standard petrographic microscope where you can look at the formation of different cements and the recrystallization of texture. Or of course, you can look at, at the, the depositional texture. And the other microscope that we have is a bit more specialized. It's called a cathodoluminescence microscope. And, and the principle behind cathodoluminescence, in case you ever encounter it in your research or during your career, is that if you put a carbonate under vacuum, so we have a vacuum chamber, and you ionize this, this carbonate, it will emit a luminescence in the brown to orange black spectrum. And that luminescence is proportional to the manganese to iron ratio of the mineral. So in other words, it's proportional to the exact um, ratio of two metals incorporated into your carbonate minerals. And that can be dolomite, calcite, aragonite, it doesn't really matter. Now, the interesting thing about cathodoluminescence is that, of course, the different environment of diagenesis are characterized by different fluids, and these different fluids are characterized by different iron to manganese ratios. So it, it's, it's one of the ways we can reconstruct um, diagenesis. Another very, very useful technique that is used quite uh, often is fluid inclusion petrography. So what are fluid inclusion? Well, when you form a mineral, you can very well imagine that this happened in an aqueous setting. In other words, we have a fluid around water. And when the mineral is formed, there is ch a chance, a high probability that some of the fluid will be trapped into the mineral. And this is known as a fluid inclusion. So you see here three types of fluid inclusion. The first fluid inclusion is actually a, a very simple fluid inclusion. It's a uh, two-phase fluid inclusion. One phase is water and the other phase is gas. Then we have a second type of fluid inclusion here, which is very similar. This fluid inclusion actually contains a liquid phase again. But what's interesting is our third type of fluid inclusion that I'm showing you, because you, you can see in this fluid inclusion that we have the fluid, that's what's around the bubble. We have a gas bubble. And you can ver see very well that we also have a solid. And that solid is basically a salt. So we have a crystal here in the center of that fluid inclusion. And this is then a three-phase fluid inclusion. It's a three-phase fluid inclusion because it has a liquid, a gas, and a solid phase. And the final fluid inclusion I want to show you has um, really two, two types of fluid. First of all, all the other ones were in, in carbonates. This one is in a beautiful quartz crystal. So fluid inclusions are not limited to to um, carbonates. But what's amazing for me in this fluid inclusion is that it contains water and the second fluid, can you guess what it is? Based on the color, it's oil. So we have fluid and some hydrocarbon 
in uh, this fluid inclusion. So fluid inclusion are extremely useful because you can gain information on the one hand on the composition of the fluids. We've seen here that we have the different phases, that we have oil, we have uh, water, so you can determine if you have different hydrocarbons that circulate. But they're also useful for a particular technique known as fluid inclusion microthermometry. And the principle is very simple. If you imagine this three-phase fluid inclusion, when it was trapped, in what form was it? Well, when it was trapped, it was a one-phase fluid with dissolved gas and dissolved salt. So the idea of uh, the microthermometry with fluid inclusion is that if you can observe this fluid inclusion and ramp up the temperature, when you get to the temperature at which the inclusion was formed, you should have a one-phase fluid inclusion. And thus, you could determine the temperature at which the mineral was formed, which is the temperature at which the inclusion was trapped. Now, that has some caveats. Um, some of the caveats is that not all of the inclusions are primary. So we have primary fluid inclusions that are included or, or, or present at time of formation of the, of the mineral. Those are the ones we want to reconstruct. We have pseudo-secondary fluid inclusion that are basically lined up around micro, micro cracks, but those micro cracks are here during the process of formation of the mineral. So those fluid inclusion are of the primary fluid. But the problem is we can also have secondary fluid inclusions that happen later in the process. That's when the mineral is cracked, reopened, a fluid is trapped, uh, the, the fracture is sealed by a new mineral phase, and so you end up with a, a fluid that has nothing to do with the condition of formation of the, the fluid inclusion. So that's one of the difficulty of using fluid inclusion. The second difficulty is the temperature of formation and the homogenization temperature is also a function of pressure, so you need to assume what the maximum pressure was. And the third difficulty of fluid inclusion, and I think this is where sometimes really it, it uh, limits the application of this technique, is that you need minerals that are large enough to be observed by microscope. So if you have a, a mineral of a few micron, 10 micron, 20 micron, it might be very difficult to observe fluid inclusion. So this is a useful technique, very used, very um, helpful, but it's not the only technique that we can use in uh, diagenesis.